Wes, we're going to figure out what you do, what you're all about, and I know you have a, a little video to show as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Wes Gould. I'm the owner of a company called Red Space. I think at this point we're the largest digital studio in Atlantic Canada. I know we were just named the best digital studio to work for in Atlantic Canada, too, too. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, most of what we do is um, websites, games, uh, video delivery platforms, content management systems, rights management systems, everything a network needs on the dot-com side. Some of our big accomplishments are Nickelodeon.com, MTV.com, the MTV Awards, Fox's video player platform, and a whole bunch of other interesting things. And here's a little video about it. Next up, Henry. Hi, Henry Shao. I work at Mattel, um, and I head up our efforts related to emerging media, technology, and also strategic partnerships. So look for um, platforms and, and, and opportunities for our brands and our content to exist in new and unique ways. Um, some of the stuff that we've done recently is uh, Hello Barbie, which you guys may have read about, is the internet-connected Barbie doll with live interactive conversations, as well as a reboot of Viewmaster. Uh, in collaboration with Google and their cardboard team and you know a few others that we've, we're launching this year. I uh, also have a quick video, uh, just the sizzle for Viewmaster, just to give you a sense of how we see that interaction and that product working. Cool. Before we go to Guillaume, I have to ask you, Henry, just to give some context to that video, just how exactly that works. I'm trying to figure it out because I'm living in like an 80s childhood and I'm picturing the viewfinder and how does it work? Yeah, I mean, so the teams have spent a lot of time trying to think about that interaction because at the same time we want to respect the Viewmaster brand, we also want to bring it to the new generation. And so the cardboard, you know, you slide the phone in. Right? And so for this, we wanted that same look and feel of Viewmaster, but sliding the phone in, but then maintaining those disks was very important. So the thought is that you have a phone and you buy the Viewmaster device. You also purchase the content packs, which come in those disks. And as you shine your Viewmaster and, uh, with the cell phone in there on that disk, the content pops up. And then as you're looking in that world of content, you can zoom in and click, just like the traditional Viewmaster, and then jump to those different points that allow for exploration and education. Amazing. All right, next up, Guillaume. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Guillaume Cohen. I'm French, but no one's perfect. Um, <laughs> and I run a company called uh, Plumsy. We're based in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley, founded by VCs, but also by Disney, Turner, and a bunch of media um, strategic investors. And we started Plumsy out of the observation that for the past 80 years, the way we tell a story on the screen uh, hasn't really changed. It's still a very passive experience. We're watching uh, characters go through issues and resolving them, but we're just an observer. Uh, and so for that, we created um, the episode category, which it's not games, it's not episode. It's really 
it's more like a TV episode where you can actually talk to characters, you can help them move along through the story. Uh, and we partner with uh, all the, the top tier studios, including uh, Warner Brothers, um, where Attila is driving uh, those initiatives um, to basically turn their existing episode into episode and also work on their next series um, to make them um, cross-platform, multi-platform from the, from the beginning. So if you want, I can show you uh, yes, what an episode down. looks like and I'll, I'll show you, uh, you know, what we work on uh, with Warner Brothers. Um, so I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna turn around uh, so you can see what I'm doing on the screen of my iPad, uh, but you'll see it also over there. So you'll see what I do with my finger will uh, <laughs> cause things to happen over there. Thanks for all the warnings. We feel prepared now. Okay. <laughs> so here, um, so a lot of the experience uh, is uh, similar to, it's basically what you would have on TV here. We repurposed an existing uh, episode and uh, work from the assets and use our technology platform to, uh, to turn it into uh, something interactive. And so you'll see that right now, for example, uh, you know, he, he needs a stamp and uh, I can actually, with my finger, take the stamp and drag it and give it to him to actually just help the character um, accomplish something. Uh, and as you go through the story, you're gonna have opportunities to, uh, to really uh, get involved using all the sensors that the platform gives you. Um, so la in that case, for example, I can pick different things and it's gonna trigger different branches uh, uh, in the narrative as well. Um, you know. And all these were animation that were already made for TV. Uh, here I can help him. Uh... So I'll show you one more, uh, just show, to show you how we use the tilt, for example. Um, so let's see, for example, that one here. So it's very empowering. Uh, you know, kids feel like they really they're helping characters. They're building more bond with uh, with them. So it's great for the brand. In this case here, when I tilt, you can see that it's making him uh, slide, uh, and that's very empowering. Also, uh, make makes me feel like I'm having an impact on the story and helping characters. Ah! Uh. <laughs> so that's that's what we do, um, and uh, that's just the the beginning. It's really the future of TV and. Uh, taking into account what all those new platforms give us as a way to interact with content, to rethink the content creation process. And we started with iPad, but we'll do also uh, virtual reality platforms and um, smart TVs and all that. Great, thank you very much. Attila? Hi, my name is Attila Gazdag. I'm with Warner Brothers based in Los Angeles, and I've managed various digital services for the company, including subscription VOD and e-commerce. But lately I've been very focused on um, you know, taking our uh, digital, um, you know, rather our kids' assets and making them available across digital media are some of our iconic kids' brands, such as Tom and Jerry, um, but some of the other ones as well, such as Looney Tunes, Scooby-Doo. And uh, it is in that context that we have actually worked with Guillaume and his team on creating this uh, episode, which was made available across the app stores um, last holiday season. Great. So um, I, I'm going to go back to you, Attila, for the first question, just to mix things up a little bit. I've read so many stats about, you know, 38% of kids under two have currently used a smartphone. 32% of kids aged six to 12 have their own tablet. I mean, we know we live in really exciting times when it comes to kids and technology. They're, they're watching things differently. They're consuming content differently. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys are doing, you know, beyond having those websites that are an extension of the brand, just to be able to keep up in, in the episodes as well? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with your stats, and you know, I see at home. I have a mini focus group. I have three three boys under ten years old, and so I see firsthand, you know, how they interact with digital media and digital devices. And depending on you know what data sources you look at, you know, you see as much as you know, almost 15 hours of television viewing time, but then about 14 plus hours of consumption through mobiles and tablets. So clearly, these devices have emerged to be an important component of the media consumption mix for kids and for plurals in a, in a broader sense. Um, and then, you, so, you, so if you take that as a paradigm, then you look at the brand like Tom and Jerry, which is a brand that has been around for 75 years. Uh, it's an iconic brand. It's, it's a fun and sort of irreverent experience. You got the friend and the foe, can live with and can, can, can't live with, can't live without. Um, 
And then you, you, how do you kind of introduce or reintroduce these characters to kids who are now growing up with tablets and smartphones? And so obviously it, it needs to become part of the media mix and we're working on different strategies to, to make that happen. Um, and you know, episodes would be one of those categories along with websites, along with you know, mobile games, along with other different types of experiences across these digital devices. Great, um, and uh, we'll move it over here to Wes. Uh, one of, I have a very small focus group, group at home. He's only six and a half, I have only one child. But uh, watching him is a phenomenal experience just to figure out his viewing habits and the things that he watches, like Stampy Longhead on uh, YouTube and all of the Minecraft videos. Uh, it's interesting to me because from the discovery process as far as how he's finding this content, sometimes it feels like he's finding it by himself. I'm not really guiding him. And that's an amazing thing that I'm seeing for a six-year-old. Can you talk a little bit about what you do as far as the type of things that you're creating that allows you to manage that the fact that the discovery process is different than it's ever been? Yeah, well, I think there's there's lots of different ways that we can kind of attack that. I, recently, one of the big successes that, uh, that we've, we've had um, was an app called Cartoon Network Anything. And what Cartoon Network Anything is, it's a, it's a micro-channel, they're calling, calling it. So it's short-form content delivered linearly made for your mobile device. The content is actually made for your mobile device. It's formatted for it. You know, it's the right, great experience there. But what we're finding is, as kids are, are, are watching this linear content delivered on their phone, it's, it's acting as a discovery network for them. Um, and you know, we've all seen statistics that on mobile, uh, as far as television goes, it's, it's an excellent discovery platform. People tend to go to the larger screen to actually watch the full-length content, but as a discovery platform, um, mobile is excellent. And with Cartoon Network Anything, we're, we're seeing a lot of that. So the same characters that everyone loves on the regular full-length Cartoon Network uh, shows, we're seeing more uptake uh, from kids um, for, uh, for toys and for the shows and for everything because they've been exposed to them in this short form uh, way on mobile, um, which is really great. And then you know, beyond that, um, another way that we see discovery is actually through the parents, um, through editorial. So for Nickelodeon, um, we have a, a site called Nick Mom, um, where we can actually you know, tell parents about the great content. And I think what's important there is you make sure that the content is attractive enough for the parent that they'll want the kids to watch it. And then the kids often do discover through their parents in that way. So how do you reach those parents? Well, I mean, hopefully you've got a brand that the, the parents, you know, respect and um, have some faith in to begin with. That, that goes a long way. Um, something like a Nick Mom is great because there's a grassroots kind of um, system to it. So it's, there's a lot of uh, sort of posting and forum and, and it's a lot of communication on social for the parents, not for the kids, obviously, because of COPA compliance, we can't do that. But I think you know, the parents become, as long as the content is good and the messaging is, is good and is actually you know, not too much on the marketing side, then you can build up that trust. And uh, I think it kind of it goes by word of mouth from there. Uh, it's really interesting you talk about on the marketing side. I'm sure all of you saw the story about YouTube recently with their uh, kids app. The fact that uh, a lot of people were boycotting the app because there are so many kids in there with videos like Evan Tube HD who are unboxing videos and many parents uh, had their, uh, their caused kind of an uproar online saying that these are marketing videos, this is advertising and not educational content. And it's a pretty fine line there, right? Um, I don't know who would, Henry, can you just sort of uh, talk about this for a second? How do you, how do you deal with that? Because it's a gray area in many ways. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've worked you, with YouTube actually very closely in launching their kids app. And, uh, you know, a big part of that launch was working with all the different advocacy groups and making sure that it was kid safe uh, and a protected environment. But I think content itself has evolved to, you know, such a point where kids, you know, they, there are certain aspects of it that that didn't exist before that they now want, right? And so for us, like, unboxing is a huge movement, and I think it's an advanced form of advertising, uh, but it's also very authentic to an experience of that product, right? And for us, it's to find that balance where it's authentic to, to the brand, but it's also balancing out the parents' concerns. Uh, but it is, there is no solution yet, and you know, we're working with YouTube, quite frankly, really closely to try to figure out the best balance of that. Uh, and, and even when you talk to the creators, I mean, it's such a wide field of creators. You have some that are so focused on education uh, and some other ones that are just want to drive entertainment. And they clash often within their own community uh, on what is the best uh, content for the child. So it's, it's an interesting time. Uh, are there Barbie unboxings online? There are. And the, the, so there's a tremendous unboxing movement online. And if you actually I have a two-year-old daughter, right? And so when I watch her interact with YouTube, it, it's amazing the things that she's picking up through those videos and the brands that she's immersed in. And it's not necessarily advertising. Like she was asking me to buy Play-Doh. 
I was like, Play-Doh, why? And then, and then I realized a lot of the unboxing videos that she's watching are, are toys wrapped in Play-Doh where they open it up. And I think it taps into a part of their mind where they're, they're sort of lusting after that, that, that unknown. Right? But it, I think what you'll see is an evolution of that movement on YouTube where now the creators are saying that's a great thing to tap into, but how do you make that meaningful and educational? Right? So how do you say take that and then elevate it to the next level um, is what we're seeing. Yeah, and how do you as a brand go in there, like you say, and, and still be authentic without putting people off because it feels too much like advertising? For, uh, for us, I mean, a big part of it is we are a product, we're a toy company first, right? And so when we look at content, it's an amazing platform to activate our brands. And when we talk about toy unboxing, one of the reasons why we haven't done it yet is we were trying to survey the landscape and also try to find a meaningful way to execute that content. So if, if we're showcasing a toy in that content, it should be about how to best a co-play experience, how to inspire your kids to be creative, how to inspire them to imagine and be, you know, discover social emotional intelligence with our toys. Uh, that's what we're trying to drive toward and I think we're, we're, we're tr still trying to figure parts of that out. And uh, Guillaume, when you're working with Warner Brothers and other companies when you're creating these episodes, what is the research process like in terms of understanding what's going to resonate with kids because we know how fickle that audience can be? Right. I mean, the thing with the episodes uh, is that it's really driven by the story and the character. So we work from actually, you know, Warner Brothers or Cartoon or Nickelodeon, whoever is the partner, we, you know, they create the narrative, which is really the, the and, and they have the characters and the brand. So that's the main appeal. Uh, the episode treatment um, is basically a way to uh, increase the immersion into the story, uh, but it's really driven by, by the brand. And that's, you know, but we have a, we have a whole process for developing those. Uh, it's very iterative. We have initial design and then we bring in kids, uh, a kids research team and we test things and sometimes, you know, kids try to touch things that are not touchable and we're like, why did you touch this? And it's like, well, I thought you would do this and that. Great. That's a great idea. We'll add it to the design. Um, so it's, it's a very agile uh, uh, process. Um, but, you know, per your earlier point, I think the, the key is being able to get involved um, and um, um, to feel like the story matters to them more, um, I think drives more engagement, more retention, builds more brand, brand equity also. Um, so yeah, that's uh, our process. And uh, Attila, from a research perspective, as far as, as creating content, you mentioned some of the websites like uh, scooby-doo.com and, uh, and these other brands. What's the process like for your organization as far as collecting data, figuring out what the kids like, what they don't like, and, and also retention? Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of research as a company. You know, we have commissioned a piece of research, you know, across, you know, on a Time Warner level. You know, Warner Brothers looks at it. I mean, I think the key, one of the key takeaways is that kids would like to have, plural as kids included, would like to have choice of content. They would like to have a choice of kind of entry point and, and media through which they can access the content. I think we, we, we need to be there. We need to be um, available and, and in a way that's innovative and potentially participatory, such as the episode. So in this case, the Tom and Jerry show from which this episode was derived is kind of a new take on Tom and Jerry. It's a new television series, and uh, season two is launching um, in the fall on, on Boomerang and, cart and various Cartoon Network properties. Uh, it has done tremendously well from a rating standpoint, and it's just another way to reintroduce, revitalize the property. So that's linear television, then sort of you go to the web, uh, you know, you make the websites available, you create these episodes through which kids can really play the story and they can literally touch and tilt and shake and, and become part of the experience, which I think is really important for them. And does it scare any of you that uh, there could be a, a kid in a basement somewhere in some small town creating content and, uh, you know, literally not costing any money and him attracting millions and millions of fans and kids who will go there for six months or a year and this in entire fan base. Is that scary to you that the, there is that power that's being put into consumers' hands, especially to children, because they are creating great content these days with the help of their parents, obviously? Are you guys fine? Or does it, is, there, is it an opportunity? I, I think it's, look, it, it, it's part, it, be, it has become part of the you know, mix that kids consume. And so in some ways it's about you're competing for, you know, a share of viewing time or, you know, a share of um, time spent. But uh, in that regard, you know, is it a competition? Well, it, indirectly it is. But at the same time, you know, it has become an integral part of what, what's available on the web for kids. And you just got to learn to adapt and, and, and sort of make that part of your, your strategy. 
And uh, I think we could probably open it up to some questions here from the audience. Uh, I'm sure you've all been thinking of questions. Anyone want to go first? Right here? We'll just wait for the mic if you don't mind. And maybe state your name and where you're from if you don't mind as well. I'm Lee Drescher. I'm from Boston. And when you spoke of touching the iPad, do you see people touching a big screen TV in the same way? And would that be safe for children? So, no. The, uh, the concept of episode is relevant to a smart TV or a virtual reality platform, this idea of engaging with characters and all that. But because the uh, physical interaction with the device is different, I mean, you're sitting a few feet away from your screen, you're not going to use the same uh, sensors and the same way to interact. So when you design your episode, you have to take into account um, what, you know, what the platform uh, can do. And so smart TV, uh, you may use, you know, maybe more voice commands using a microphone and talking to characters and influencing the story that way, or uh, motion detection, or maybe, you know, your um, tablet or phone more as a rem smart remote that would allow you to, um, uh, to influence the course of the story. So, yeah, it's uh, different, yeah. It's, you have to take into account the platform when you envision how you're gonna tell the story in a more engaging way on that platform. And Wes, maybe you wanna take a stab at that as well. Well, it, it's something Nickelodeon's experimented with. I know that we've sort of helped out on an, a, a motion uh, tracking based um, integration with some, some Nickelodeon TV shows that actually that sort of creates branching in the show so the kids can kind of, like, a, like the old choose your own adventure books, the kids can sort of get some degree of control of the way that the, uh, the program actually unfolds. Um, you know, I think there's a time and place for that. I mean, sometimes you want that lean forward, interactive, uh, participatory kind of uh, feeling. Sometimes you want the lean back, just tell me a great story. I think it, it depends on the type of story. Uh, other questions? All right, right here, if we can get the mic over here in the middle of the room, please. Thanks very much, a really uh, compelling story. It's really, really neat. Um, can I squeak in two questions? Sure, why um, not? Thanks. Uh, my first question is we always see the successes, you know, and it's you, the demonstrations that you had here um, is really compelling, and we've, we've all seen children in, you know, interacting with interactive media and, and how really compelling it is. Is there any stuff that, that you've tried that just doesn't work, that you're like, oh, we tried that, that was just didn't fly, that you, that you found wasn't engaging? And so have there, been, have there been projects in the past, I guess, that you've learned from that have informed the successful ones that we see today? Anyone want to take that? No one likes to admit uh, their failures, I, but. No, I can, I can. I can. OK. Go ahead, I mean, I think you know, part of it is when you're innovating, you're, you're inherently taking on risk, right? So take smart risk, right? Fell fast, fell forward, all the stuff that, you know, really just sort of drives um, a positive experience out of that. And I would say from us, like, I would say one recent example is, you know, at Mattel, we launched a line of products called Activity. And that really was physical plus digital, right? And we launched that three years ago, I think, before sort of the movement, the consumer adoption became more of the social, the norm. Uh, so our products were priced higher because what happens is when you have that product and you interact with a digital uh, experience on an iPad, it unlocks certain features and content. But I think the, the we, we didn't have enough patience in market because it was a new behavior, it was a new expectation, it was a new price point to really sort of market it effectively. And that's sort of like the new world and the old world because, you know, on a typical CPG toy company, we expect results within three to four months. But if you're driving a new consumer behavior and an adoption, that takes time. So I think part of it is, yes, we learned from that. And actually, now we're like, we were a bit ahead of our time. If you look at Skylanders and Disney Infinity, all of that stuff, we were the precursor to that. But again, we killed the project because it didn't perform in the six months that we had it in market. So I think there's a lot of different elements. You always have to try to innovate and take that risk. But do it smartly. I mean, you have insights. You have research. You also have the consumer right, that can tell you directly in these days, you have that direct connection with them, uh, what they're looking for. And that, those are our sort of guiding lights. They don't give you the answer, but they sort of give you some directional feedback. I think big, big companies are like big ships. They take a long time to turn. So I think the trick is to get a small group inside that big organization. Like we have a lot of emerging platform groups that help. We're, right now are working on things for Android Auto and a bunch of cool stuff to show television to kids in cars where they're literally a captive audience, which is great. Um, 
But I think you, you form a small team and you fail. If you fail, fail quickly and learn from it. And then it's fine. I mean, there's no, it's not a failure if you learn something from it and it, move, it makes you money down the road. All right, I think I'm getting the sign to wrap. Can we squeeze in his second question? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's probably a lot of content developers and maybe producers in the room. Do you ever entertain conversations from external sources, like you have in in-house teams? Do people ever come to you externally with an idea for, for some sort of interactive media that you might take on? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like that's part of the reason why, for us, for example, my role involves strategic partnerships. Is to a lot of it is actually coming from external parties, right? And so they have amazing creative talent and ideas, and it's finding the right fit. Uh, for our brands, our platforms, or a potential white space within our area. Um, I think more and more companies are coming to realize, you know, the build, it's not just build or buy, it's a lot of it is around partnerships and then figuring out outside of your four walls who to work with in, in, in the field that's areas that you want to grow your business. Great. So just some closing words from people on the panel. Attila, we'll start with you. What should people watch out for from Warner Brothers in the future? I mean, we were looking at various categories, particularly on, on mobile, you know, both phones and tablets. And obviously, mobile games is a category that's well understood. And Warner Brothers has a very successful games business. But outside of games, you know, there are emerging categories that are, I think, very interesting, particularly for our kids' brands, whether that's storybooks, interactive storybooks, you know, virtual pets and kind of uh, talking toys, um, you know, episodes, uh, education or edutainment, I think, is an opportunity that we haven't really explored and you know we're, we're, we're evaluating it. So I, I think we're looking at various categories and hopefully over time we'll, we'll get to be able to execute pretty successfully. And uh, I would say episodes continues to remain an area of interest to us and uh, perhaps there's something more in this particular space that, that we, we can do in the future. Okay, I'm getting the hard wrap sign. Can you say like in, in a couple words, Guillaume? What's the next big <laughs> yeah. thing for you guys? Yeah, I think it's, it's great time, great time now, great opportunity to uh, expand narratives beyond TV. So it's not all those things, those expectations from kids, they're not here to replace TV, they're here to expand TV. And now we are, brands have opportunities to build um, you know, character brands, their, their brands across multiple media and, and bring them all into one um, you know, narrative experience. So that's great. Uh, Henry? Um, I mean, I, you see a lot of fragmentation, but you're also seeing a lot of convergence. So I think the important thing is to identify purpose and purposeful and meaningful executions on the platforms that are relevant for, for your goals and ambitions as a company and brand. Wes. Yeah, I, I would agree absolutely with what you say. I mean, the, the package has to be nice as well. And in a way, the package needs to be an experience. When I say the package, I mean the delivery platform. It needs more and more needs to be just as engaging as the content inside of it. And again, I think you know the iOS's or the OS's from Android and from um, from uh, from uh, Macintosh, from Apple, uh, for cars are super exciting, and if you can get on get in on that right now, it's it's only going to blow up. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure we we could talk forever about this. We do have to wrap up. Maybe you guys are willing to go into the hallway if people have more questions and hang out for a little bit. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. Great great session. Thank you.